So, um, in 2009, on this very evening, I was crawled underneath a stairwell in an underground parking lot, three stories down in Pasadena, California. And I had my head on a knapsack, and I had my coat as a blanket, <clears throat> and I was trying to fall asleep. And if on that night, someone had snuggled up next to me and whispered to me, hey, in six years, you're going to be standing in an auditorium at the University of Massachusetts, one of the great public universities of America, and you're going to be talking to the students there, I would have turned to that person and said, of course, <laughs> naturally, I was homeless, and not briefly. I was homeless off and on. I lived on the streets for nearly two years. I was neither a drug addict nor an alcoholic, nor was I a criminal. But I had committed one of the basic American sins. I had failed. Over the course of about eight years, my career ended, my savings vanished, we lost the house, then my family broke apart, and I ended up homeless and alone. It was an incredible experience, and uh, one that has shaped me in many ways. I... Uh, the reason it was so hard for me was I, I was a TV writer, so the fall was really tremendous. I, was a, I wrote on television for about 12 years, including a stint on Roseanne where I worked on 111 episodes of that great show. So uh, if you're wondering, is TV comedy writing a great job? Are you kidding? It's the greatest job ever invented. You sit around in a room with eight, eight or ten other smart funny, equally neurotic people, arguing about a script all day long, and then at some point you walk down to the stage and you get to see actors rehearse your speech, rehearse your lines, see, see this, this thing you've written come alive. Then on tape night, there's a studio audience of real people, and they're laughing at stuff you wrote that's being said by these great actors. And then afterwards, you go to a saloon and you commiserate, and you get, and, you're, and you're just congratulating yourself over and over. It's the greatest job ever. Except it wasn't. Now, I made a lot of money as a TV writer. Um, I, uh, as a writer-producer, you're compensated on an episode basis. And in the late 90s, I was making about $300,000 a year. And then there was one year where a studio paid me another $650,000 just to come up with ideas for TV series. It was heaven, except it wasn't for my family. It wasn't for my wife, Marina, and it wasn't for my eight children. That's just, yeah, that's right, eight. <laughs> as just as a side note, I would just say there was no religious or philosophical reason for it. We just had eight kids. But anyway... <laughs> um, now, the skill set that I had as a, as a TV writer, you know, being a Weis Weisenheimer guy who could always argue all day long, that really didn't apply. That, it wasn't a transferable skill set to a real family with a real wife and real kids. When you have, uh, I mean, I was paid a lot of money to come up with great lines for a sitcom dad to say to his sitcom daughter who was going through a sitcom crisis. That doesn't transfer real well when you're dealing with a real daughter and real sons and a real wife. And the burden of, plus the hours were tremendous. I would work from 10 in the morning, off until 3 a.m. the following morning. The easy, the easy days were tape nights where we ended at around 11 o'clock. So I was barely at home. The house wasn't really a home for me. It was a place I checked in on on the weekend. And my wife, Marina, was really struggling. So I needed to step away. I'd made a lot of money. I'd done real well. It was time for me to focus on my real job, which was husband and father. And so I took a couple of years off. And it was great. I restored balance to my family. I was happy. Things calmed down. And then I decided, you know what? It's time for me to go back to television. Well. Television had other ideas. 
in the time that I was out on my uh, leave to be a father, reality programming boomed. Uh, in 2001, 2002, there were 43 sitcoms on television. Uh, two years later, when I was thinking of returning, there were now about 30, and the staff sizes had shrunk dramatically. By 2007, 2008, there were 18 sitcoms left on television. Plus, at this point, I was now 50, which they don't, they don't really tell you this until you get to that point. At 50, you're officially no longer funny. So, anyway, so I just couldn't find work. There was impossible to be, for me to find work. So I thought, well, I'll just do, I'll just find other work, writing or editing jobs. I sent out between 2006, 2005, I should say, and 2011, I did a search on my, my email accounts, looking for the word resume or application. I sent out 2,541 applications or resumes, and I got no jobs. So by 2006, we were in big trouble. We lost our house to foreclosure. Now, I should just say this. When you, you, when you lose your house to foreclosure, you actually, you don't lose the house. The house doesn't go anywhere. You're the one who's lost. You're the one who has to leave. We struggled for another couple of years, and by 2008, we were absolutely broke. I had four children still at home, two in high school and two in middle school and elementary school. Marina, my wife, is a German citizen, so she said, look, why don't I just go to Germany? I, we can live off the benevolence of the German welfare state. And so I found places, families, for my two who were in high school to stay while I tried to see if I could get something going. And that left me homeless. I had no place to stay. Now, the first night you're homeless, it has this stinging feeling like you've just been punched in the face. You know, like when you're in eighth grade and you're fighting, you know, the slow fat kid and, and you're, you're like, you're going to beat him up and all of a sudden he hits you in the face and you didn't, you, I mean, like, how did that happen to me? How did I get punched in the face by that kid? It hurts. It's embarrassing. It's humiliating. And so then you just go home and you come home and your mother's making soup and she asks how your day was. And you say, it was fine, just leave me alone. And you go to your room and you lie in your bed. Except on this night, there was no one making soup for me. There was no home to go to. There was no bed. I was homeless. So I thought, well, Pasadena, it's a nice night, I'll go for a walk. So I started walking around. This won't be so bad, I can do this. And all these other lies that you would tell yourself to try to make it feel like you weren't really going through this. I ended up in a park. And, um, you know, it's like, it's about midnight now. Dew is starting to settle on the benches. Or the, I sit on the park bench. And uh, I see there's a homeless man over there with his shopping cart and stuff arrayed out. And I'm thinking, seems to have figured it out. And then I thought, nah, you know, and I'm not like him. I'm better than him. Except I'm not better than him. I am him. I'm the exact same person as him. Maybe I can, so I sit there on the bench, and for about an hour, maybe it's a few minutes, my head starts to droop, I start to fall asleep, and then I wake up. I don't want to sleep on the bench. I'm too exposed. Someone could come along and beat me up, take my backpack. Or maybe the police would come and arrest me for sleeping in the park. Or maybe a coyote would attack me. I mean, I've seen coyotes out in the city at this time of night. They're always on some mission. Maybe they just go for garbage or an old weakened animal. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe in this light, I look like an old weakened animal. So I decide to get up. And I go walk some more, and there it is, a parking garage. I walked down into it, I walked around, and I found a space under the stairwell. 
It was dark. It was quiet. It was still warm from the heat of the day. I laid down, put a backpack, put my head down on my backpack, covered myself with my coat, and slowly, almost effortlessly, I finally fell asleep. I had defeated the night. And that's what I did and had to do for the next two years. Every day, I had to defeat the night. I learned a lot of things about myself when I was homeless. I learned that I'm more resourceful than I ever knew. I'm significantly less respectable than I imagined. And I'm far more resilient than I ever dreamed. I also learned something interesting about hunger. Um, now, I'm talking about hunger, the, intellect, the physical or psychological state of hunger. You know, of all the psychological states you can be in, intellectual fervor, erotic desire, religious joy, uh, fear, anger, hunger is the most complex and profound. Now, by hunger, I don't mean, geez, I didn't have lunch today, I'm starving. That's not hunger, that's hungry. Hunger is what you experience when you go three, four, five days without eating much. And the first few days... You have a lot of anxiety. You're thinking constantly about food. You're edgy. You're desperate. You're on, uh, you, you don't know what's going to happen. But around the third or fourth day, you start this calm sort of starts to come over you. It starts to almost just fall on you. You start to not worry so much. Your clothes start to drape on you, which is not a bad feeling. But it's not a... It's a sort of bliss, but it's not a pleasant bliss. It's, it's, just an, it's just a bliss where there's no ang anxiety. You're just relaxed. You know there's no solution to your problem, so you're just going to let it go. You're just going to experience what you're going to experience, and that's it. What, have I, what, did, I, what did I take from, from being... Uh, from what I went through. Well, in some senses, I took nothing from being homeless and poor. I mean, literally nothing. Well, before I, uh, when, when I was doing well, I had a five bedroom, 4,000 square foot house in San Marino, California, which is one of the wealthiest suburbs in, in California. It was full of books and art and appliances and a grand piano and clothes and I had three cars. And after it, I show you, this is what I have left. This is all I have left from that life. This is a wallet. This is a wallet my daughter made for me. <laughs> in a leather crafting class when she was in sixth grade 20 years ago. This is it. This is all I have left. One of the things I learned about all this stuff I have is that stuff is completely replaceable. They have stores now that are selling stuff. You can just go there, buy all of it, bring it into your house, and you're, you have everything that you used to have, you can get it back. But the, the one thing that I really wanted, that the one thing that I truly missed, was a room and a bed and the people I love. You know, let me just say this about a bed. <laughs> there is nothing better than a bed. This is my place. This is where I go. These walls are my protection. This, I crawl under this, the blankets at night, I put my head in on that pillow, and I fall asleep. This is my Eden. It's my paradise. The only thing I learned about during my years, and really this is the final thing I'd like to point about, is about shame. I hid my situation from 
virtually everyone. I used to dress like this. I looked like a normal person. Um, because one reason is I didn't want my children to have to ask uncomfortable questions about what was going on with their father. But the other thing is that in America, it is shameful to be poor. And one of the things I learned in the two years that I lived on the street is, no, it's not shameful to be poor. Being poor and homeless and vulnerable is painful, difficult, and devastating. But it is not shameful. I am proud that I was poor and homeless. I am proud that I was vulnerable and alone. Because those years were the best of me. And I know what I can get through. I know what I can endure. And I'll have a great story when I get to the other side. Thank you.